All right, it's 345, so that means I can get started. So welcome everybody, good afternoon. Today we're discussing conquering imposter syndrome in the open source community, so if you're not here to see that, then uh, see you later, bye. If you are, sweet. Um, we're here. Or you can watch it anyway. We yeah, can you can also watch it on YouTube later. Um, so anyway, today we're going to discuss imposter syndrome, what it is, how it may be affecting you, and how you can overcome self-doubt to improve your career. So, a little bit about us. My name is Heather Rodriguez. I am an engineer, aka a front-end web developer at Civic Actions. Uh, I started my career in Drupal around 2009-ish. I was actually a student at the University of Maryland majoring in English and decided, hey, I don't want to starve. So, <laughs> I took an internship, started doing some HTML, CSS, got a job at the College of Arts and Humanities at the University of Maryland, then worked my way into government contracting, and here I am uh, at Civic Actions. I'm Kat Kuhl. I'm a director of technology at Sheaf in DC. Uh, like Heather, I majored in liberal arts. I actually majored in US foreign policy in the Middle East. And as you can see, I am currently solving that crisis, I guess, I don't know. As we speak. As we speak. So uh, instead, I ended up going into development, which is something that I'd learned when I was a little bit younger and clearly uh, ended up determining it's my calling. So I've been doing Drupal since about uh, 2009, and I've been in the Drupal community more actively since about 2012. I'm Sarah Jane Thrasher. I'm a senior front end developer at Acquia. Uh, I have a similar story. I too majored in liberal arts and I just wanted to actually be able to pay off my student loans. So um, I had a sort of short segue through doing uh, print design and then I actually wound up uh, doing web dev, um, did a WordPress, did a Drupal, and kind of stuck with Drupal, and here I am. So we all three are friends from the Washington, D.C. meetup scene. We all have worked at one point or another at Rock Creek, which is now Chief, and uh, we've given this presentation several times now. The first was in Nice Camp and Bad Camp at 2015, and here we are at DrupalCon 2017. Woo. So, imposter syndrome. If you find yourself much like this adorable golden retriever, thinking, God, I have no idea what I'm doing, and any moment the, the fraud police are going to find me out, uh, you may be suffering from imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is defined as the inability to internalize one's successes and achievements, despite uh, evidence to the contrary. So if you are constantly plagued with fears of self-doubt and inadequacies, you may be suffering from imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome is not to be conflated with being an actual beginner. Everybody, when they're at the beginning of their career, feels inadequate and like they may not belong in a room full of experts. That's just called learning. Uh, being an imposter, feeling like you are an imposter is when uh, you have evidence to the contrary. There's, um, you, maybe you've uh, moved up the ranks, you've got multiple presentations, promotions, uh, you know, successes under your belt, but yet you still feel like you are junior um, and you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Imposter syndrome is also not being a failure. So um, just because you feel like you may be an imposter, News flash, you are not alone. Uh, it's not unusual for people who uh, have made their way up in their career to feel like they're imposters. This uh, phenomenon, it's not, a, it's not a, uh, this phenomenon is first studied in the 1970s by a pair of researchers, Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes. And they studied a group of successful women uh, in various specialties that had PhDs, that were respected professionals in their fields, and yet they all felt like they had somehow lucked their way into their jobs and uh, that they didn't quite belong. So the re this is particularly pernicious when you belong to an already underrepresented group. Uh, you know, if you're, for example, a woman, you are also being held back by the fact that societally you don't quite belong in a group. And so if you're help holding yourself back, uh, it could be doubly damaging to your life. So uh, how can imposter syndrome affect you? Uh, for uh, people who suffer from imposter syndrome, frequently they can burn themselves out because they're constantly working long hours and overcompensating for their fears, and um, so which leads to higher stress and burnout from either their job or the community, and uh, um, yeah, burning out. Gotcha. Uh, also, you may uh, choose to self-select out of pursuing advanced job opportunities and higher salaries. And so you really, um, 
maybe limiting your overall wages in your life and access to leadership roles, when in reality, you can do the job just fine. Uh, which This is bad for both a personal and a professional level because um, you are basically excluding yourself from leadership positions in your job in the community. So, like I mentioned, the community could lose your voice. You belong in this community. Every one of you right here is a member of the community, whether you feel like it or not. And at this con in particular, I think we're talking a lot about diversity and inclusivity. And so if you share your knowledge and experience, you're really contributing a valuable talent and resource to the open source community. So good news, uh, imposter syndrome is just a trap. Uh, once you realize it, just like this little cat, you're gonna be able to get out of the box. Uh, and Presumably. Yeah, n no, no cats hopefully were harmed in the making of this photo. Um, so one of the first things that really helps you to learn to cope with this feeling is realizing that it's not just you who feels like this. This isn't some sort of psychological thing that you've picked up. A lot of people feel this way from a lot of different walks of life. And one of the, the reasons is because you're holding yourself up against um, ridiculous standards that basically nobody actually needs. Um, and if you continue to hold yourself against this, this sort of uh, standard that isn't really meetable, you're never gonna, you're never gonna meet it, and you're always gonna feel like you're falling short. Um, you need to forgive yourself for having these type of feelings, and uh, start giving yourself tools to cope with them when they do pop up in work or community situations. Um, one of the things that you might do to avoid being in a situation that triggers these type of feelings is be overly professionistic. You might spend extra time looking over your code segment like before you put it up as a pull request or a patch. Uh, you might just be putting in tons and tons of extra hours at work, like seven or eight hour weeks regularly, just to sort of prove yourself to maybe even just yourself. Nobody is like asking you to do this kind of thing, and yet you continuously do this to try to fight this feeling back. Um, and the reason, the main reasons to forgive yourself for this and accept it is if you are actually out here building real websites, trying to solve problems for people, you're gonna make tons of mistakes. It just means that you're out there doing your job, living your life, and learning things. And uh, this quote here uh, from Neil Gaiman is actually really interesting. There's a, a link here where he was actually giving a commencement address. If you haven't heard of him, yeah, he's a, a world best-selling author. He's had a lot of his novels and short stories made into graphic novels, TV shows, movies. Um, and uh, him and a lot of other people in, in like that sort of tier, like you think, you know, people love your work, you're always talking to fans, and yet he, he's talking about here, his like personal feeling was that despite this long list of acclaim and industry awards and just people coming up and telling him how much they love him, he still feels like any day now people are gonna come knock on his door and tell him that he's gotta give it up because he's not a real author. And it's amazing like how many different types of people and backgrounds and different walks of life have these same types of feelings. <clears throat> um, the, uh, uh, one of the interesting things about imposter syndrome in the software community is there's um, kind of a interesting high standard out there. It's, it's, there's this thing called the myth of the genius programmer, where if you, if you picture sort of like who you think of as like a real hacker, uh, it may be, you know, kind of this like Mark Zuckerberg type of 20-something young white male, you know, sailed through Cal 3, like hacked <laughs> through the weekend, started like two or three companies, um, and you know, runs around in, like black hoodies and sneakers all the time, like Silicon Valley. Um, and so, um, if, you're, if you're, you know, comparing yourself against this sort of like legendary type of person, like you, you may actually meet some of those type of criteria personally. Like it's not like nobody does any of these things, but so many of us do not fit these boxes. And um, you know, every, every industry kind of has something similar to this. It's not always programming, but um, you shouldn't be holding yourself up against that standard. And you shouldn't think that all these people around you are actually that when in reality, you know, we're, we're all human, we all come from different backgrounds. So my first ever community event, I mentioned I've been doing Drupal since 2009. The first time I actually went to an event was in 2012. Uh, it was Maryland camp in Baltimore, so down the road that way probably. Uh, and I, at the time, was just a really technical project manager. 
I wasn't technically a developer, but I had built sites in Drupal. And so I showed up and I was expecting that because I was a project manager and not a developer, I was gonna spend the entire time meeting these people who were crazy good at it. Uh, and that I was going to be immediately shamed and I don't know, thrown out probably. <laughs> so uh, I, what was really helpful for me was this event that they did to kick off the camp. Uh, we got us all in an auditorium and uh, had us raise our hands and then leave them up for the things that we had done with Drupal so far. So I think the first one was log into Drupal and edit content. Okay, I've, I've done that. Uh, building a content type, building a view, building views with arguments, which was like the retro <laughs> contextual filters for Drupal 6, it was a while ago, uh, and then doing theming and then finally doing module development. So I didn't put my hand down until pretty much the end of the, the sorting, sorting hat activity. So uh, I ended up kind of getting sorted into the advanced track and learning that even though I'd come there prepared to really have no idea what I was talking about and just be learning from the people around me, not only was I doing fine, there were people who could actually learn from me. And it went a long way toward breaking down this idea that uh, you know, I was not deserving to be in that community of developers and ultimately led to me going a developer route in my career. Uh, so I would definitely advise getting out and talking to people, especially if you do have that insecurity. You guys are all at DrupalCon, so presumably you are talking to people in the community. Uh, but it's really valuable to share notes with them and talk about what you know, what they know, and where you can help each other. And uh, so another moment for me that was really uh, illuminating was at a BOF in Austin, DrupalCon 2014, I believe. So there was a BOF with all of the major ma uh, theme maintainers at the time. So I had currently just been in the <coughs> gospel of John Alban route. You know, I thought like everything, you know, that he had said was gold. And then all of a sudden, there's all these other theme maintainers and they can't agree on what the best practices are. And, you know, and I'm like, oh man, if these experts can't figure out what we should be doing and can't agree on it, like what, what makes me think I can? And so just by demystifying the experts, um, I think it helps to realize like that you're not doing um, as poorly as you thought. Cool. So uh, the main takeaway here is it's not really fair to compare yourself against people who you know may or may not be way ahead of you or people who are coming along behind and just learning. The best person to compare yourself against any given time is past you, you a year ago, uh, and how you've come along and how you're doing now. Uh, so the quote on the screen is from uh, South, the previous quote is from a South by panel, where people were talking about the experience of um, especially being a minority in, t uh, in their universities and like feeling this intense pressure to be the best person in the room. I am realizing that comparing themselves to where they were a year ago was gonna have way, way more fruit. I highly recommend taking a look at uh, this article. But then as you start tearing down your unrealistic standards, it's not enough to say, I'm not gonna compare myself to anything. You have to find some way to measure what you're doing and how you're progressing in your career. So if you do feel like a fraud regularly, if you feel like you're making mistakes all the time, which we all are, unfortunately, uh, then it's really important to start logging the accomplishments that you have rather than focusing on the mistakes that you're making. The more that you shy away from opportunity because you're afraid that you're going to end up failing at it, the less opportunity you have to genuinely rack up those accomplishments. So this is important in particular for people who are imposters because as one of the, the major books that I strongly recommend uh, kind of laid it out, the inability to recognize and internalize the accomplishments that you're having is the very heart of imposter syndrome. This is the point. The fact that no matter what you rack up, you still look back on it and say, well, that didn't really matter, or you know, they would have said that to anyone, or that award was fake. So uh, BuzzFeed has like the my favorite series of charts on imposter syndrome. <laughs> there are like 13 of these, and you should all go look at them. <laughs> uh, especially if you have imposter syndrome, you start telling yourself that when you get this positive feedback or these compliments, whoever's saying anything nice to you is either like they can see you're struggling and they're just trying to be like, oh, you're doing super well to encourage you but not really meaning it. Or that uh, they are your mom and dad and they have no idea what you do for a living. My, yeah, it's a struggle, it's real. So uh, it's really hard when you are taking away the credibility of the people who are giving you this positive feedback because it keeps you in that box with that uh, sad, adorable cat. So you can start getting over that by keeping more conscious track of the recognition that you receive. Uh, many, many moons ago, when I was a, a web producer kind of starting out in the field, I had a mentor, Rich Panzer, and he told me that I needed to start keeping track of the emails I got from clients who were saying, 
you know, you're doing a great job on contract or bosses saying that I was doing well or coworkers being like, thank you, you just made my week. So uh, my basic reaction to that was very skeptical. <laughs> Legit my favorite part of the presentation right here, you call me now. <laughs> my reaction was really skeptical because I felt like for one thing, it was really touchy-feely. Uh, for another thing, I felt like it would kind of be a jerk thing to do, to get positive feedback and then immediately file it in a folder. Uh, and thirdly, I felt like I get emails like that all the time. They don't mean anything, which is a really great example of being an imposter. So uh, I ended up doing it anyway because uh, he wasn't giving me feedback on how to like become a more actualized person, which would have also been fine. He was giving me feedback on how to move up at my job. So I ultimately did keep this folder. I did use it to make an argument to uh, move up from project coordinator to project manager. Uh, and it ended up being helpful for me professionally, but I think more important for me was the psychological benefit of being able to look and say, look, I am doing well at what I'm doing. This is not like, you know, imagined or fictional advancement. So that's good for the day-to-day -day stuff, but there are also some uh, bigger occasions that are, are also hard to kind of internalize. <laughs> so <laughs> if you get an award and your immediate reaction is, that award was really easy to win, or that award was for participation. It becomes really hard <laughs> to internalize the uh, fact that she won it at all. I've had this reaction. I got uh, nominated and then won an award, and my actual reaction at the time was, huh, I bet they gave this to everybody. <laughs> so this resonated with me a lot. Rather than focusing on the fact that I'd been nominated by people who worked with me, I was thinking that the contest was like rigged. So if you do uh, talk yourself down like that, there are other things you can do to internalize that achievement. Uh, so that immediate reaction of if I'm keeping track of stuff that people are saying about me that's good or I'm getting compliments or awards, but that makes me a jerk. Um, a, a lot of people have been socialized into this feeling like it's better to be humble. You don't want to come across as that jerk. Nobody likes somebody who likes to talk about themselves. But like honestly, there's nothing wrong with feeling like you did like a good job, especially if you did. You know, you're working hard at your job, on your project, or whatever you did, and it's great that people want to come and tell you that you did a good job. Um, and people will feel good about telling you that too. So like, why blow them off? Um, the, uh, the slides here, um, these are photos of donuts from this woman here, Lara Hogan's donut blog. And uh, she's the director of engineering at Etsy. And she's also written a few books. One of them's a really good book on front end performance. And uh, the thing she does here is whenever she has an accomplishment in her career, such as speaking at a conference, getting a book deal, getting a book published, getting a raise. She actually, she not just goes out and buys herself some kind of treat and enjoys it, she puts it up on this blog so that she's accountable to her friends and coworkers for having you know, celebrated something that she did. And that's a really great thing to try because it is actually uncomfortable to be grat you know, grateful to other people for acknowledging you or even just admitting to yourself that you did something cool. And if you do uh, feel like that, there are the big awards, there's the day-to-day -day accomplishments, but one of the hardest things for people to do, gracefully, I think, if they feel like frauds, is to just accept the verbal feedback they get in person gracefully. Uh, if you have ever uh, had your manager come to you and say, any, and say, hey, great job, or you know, I really appreciated your work here, or thanks for turning it around so quickly, and you probably recognize one of these responses at least, these are really common ways to react to recognition if you feel like you don't deserve it. It's no big deal, or you know, Sarah did most of the work, even if your work was really critical in that. Uh, I see project managers do this a lot, well, where they'll say, oh, well, the team really, you know, the team did all the work, and you're like, you manage the project, you made it happen, <laughs> take the praise. Good uh, teams don't just happen. That's a very real fact. Uh, my personal favorite is I just Googled it, because I swear uh, if I had a dollar for every time I heard this, I would no longer have a need to work. Uh, we are all developers, we're all just Googling it. We exist on Stack Overflow, like it's okay. Uh, it's really important to be able to retrain yourself to say thank you gracefully for a couple reasons. One is that if you constantly have that flow of negative down top going, it's gonna get harder for you to internalize it, and then it's gonna get harder for you when you're in an interview to say, uh, not to say, well that was no big deal, that didn't really matter, and try to shrug things off and not call attention to your accomplishments in the interview, which can really hurt you professionally. And the second reason is that uh, as a manager, if I go to give someone feedback regularly and I tell them, hey, you're doing great, I'm loving your work, and they keep replying to me by saying, eh, yeah, you know, nah, not really. Uh, either I have to conclude that they are totally disconnected from reality or that they actually did just Google it and their work wasn't valuable. 
do not put your manager in that position. Invest in learning how to say thank you, and it'll help you by retraining your brain, and it'll also help uh, your career in other important ways. So uh, we've touched on this before, but another really important aspect for all three of us in getting uh, over, or rather managing, let's, let's set the bar, low, uh, imposter syndrome <laughs> is getting active in the Drupal community. So whether that's been uh, speaking at conferences or camps or uh, contributing documentation of patches, I uh, helped to organize Bad Camp now, uh, I created a Drupal users group at the University of Maryland, um, uh, but either whatever, whatever route you take to contribute, uh, it's really helped us feel a sense of um, that we were valued uh, among our peers. And also, the more concrete evidence that you start accruing, um, whether it's you know, speaking at the cons or contributing uh, code or whatnot, you really can help reaffirm your sense of accomplishment so that you don't fall back on a subjective value, but rather concrete uh, achievements. So uh, I mentioned that I built my own support network at the University of Maryland, and that was really critical because we would meet monthly and we would sort of have this place outside of our jobs in which we could talk about you know, the challenges that we were facing and provide support for one another and just you know, give each other demos and maybe like, catch on to cool things that other people were doing. And I think it's really important to have an outlet that is professional outside of your job because you need to be able, if you're an imposter, you have all these deep-seated fears and you need to have a place to express those without any judgment or you know, retribution possibly from uh, people who could influence your career. So, um, so that was important for that aspect. And also just being perceived as a leader in my local community, it was really, um, it helped me actually own my shit and learn, like I had to actually start learning about the things that people were coming to me and asking me questions about. Um, but then I had to a certain, at some point acknowledge that I knew what I was talking about because people kept coming to me and asking me questions. Um, Uh, another important aspect is uh, finding somebody that you can teach. And you're probably sitting here and saying, I don't have anything that I can teach. Uh, and I would tell you that you're absolutely wrong. Uh, my, the first person that mentored me, when I told her years later that I considered her a mentor, she kind of laughed. She was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but when I started out my career, and I was like using this Adobe Dreamweaver crap. And I was like, you know, I don't know how to make, you know, CSS work. Uh, um, and she, uh, you know, a lot of people were kind of impatient with me. And they were, you know, as she, Megan Wang in the College of Arts and Humanities, she dedicated so much time just to sit down and help explain things and help me like, you know, tame these uh, HTML websites. And it was through her guidance and her mentorship that eventually I started the Drupal Users Group. I was able to gain enough confidence that it helped propel me throughout my career, and I would not be here today if it wasn't for my mentor. And almost everybody that has stuck with doing Drupal or uh, contributing back to Drupal has some kind of similar story about like showing up at a sprint or some kind of like the Drupal ladder or things like that, and having somebody welcome them, and at least being a friendly face and showing them the ropes, and that can totally be you. And uh, it's also very likely that you have genuine expertise that you can contribute to people as well as being that friendly face and that helpful person for them. It's really common to hear people say that they can't help others, that, you know, but wait, I mean, I get what you're saying, but you, you're trying to talk to, like, skilled people. You're not trying to talk to me. And uh, there's a really interesting anecdote about the finance world, actually, that has been very applicable to this. Uh, we found the story of a finance group um, in private equity and venture capital, really glad I got that phrase right this time, <laughs> uh, where they were putting together a mentor-mentee uh, program for women. And the woman going around organizing it kept talking to different women and saying, hey, can you participate? You know, we need some mentors, we need some mentees, come and uh, be part of this. And she kept getting the answer every single time, wait, like I would love to participate as a mentee, but I don't have anything to offer anyone. And finally, she started telling women, like, look, everyone is telling you this, including the high-level managing director of a venture capital firm. Like, I, you guys have things to offer each other, and you're just not seeing it. So uh, it's really interesting that even when you do get to the top, even when you reach a point where you genuinely can share that expertise with others, you still feel like you don't, you don't deserve to be where you are. Uh, 
I, in uh, 2012, at uh, Drupal, 13, 14, God, 2014 at DrupalCon, uh, I had just been promoted to Director of Technology at Chief. And I was about to give a presentation and I was so terrified that I would get up there and talk about technology and have someone realize that I straight up did not deserve to be where I was, that I fought my presenters uh, to take my actual title off the slide <laughs> and fortunately lost that argument. Uh, and in the years since then, I've tripled the size of our technology team, I've won like multi-million dollar contracts and I clearly deserve to be where I was, but I was completely uh, incapable of internalizing that at the time. So there are tons of stories from women and from men like this around the community uh, where people don't realize how much they can offer the people around them. You can do that by just sharing your time and your experience with people who are struggling, uh, by just making the space for them to come to you and talk to you about what they need. You can do that by reviewing code and presentations, uh, whether that's front-end code or back-end code or contributing in uh, sprints. And you can also blog about what you know. Sometimes just writing down a problem you're having and putting it on the internet so the next person having that problem winds up at your blog post can be a phenomenally helpful thing to contribute to other people who are struggling. And then getting all the comments saying like, you just made my life is definitely gonna help you with that uh, feeling on your own as well. Uh, you can also speak. And this is probably one of the hardest ways to share your uh, information and expertise with a room. Uh, it's, it's really hard to get in front of people and talk uh, about the things that you can contribute because you are always picturing someone in the back of the room saying, look, what makes you, uh, what makes you worthy to talk this topic about uh, to me? You guys can get up and say that later. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got this advice from WebChick, uh, one of the Drupal core maintainers at a DrupalCon uh, to speak. And I like, looked over my shoulder to figure out who she was talking to and wound up speaking and finding out that I really enjoyed it and discovering in the process that it's not really about being the foremost expert on every possible topic, it's more about picking something uh, and giving your own spin on it. So, uh, spoiler alert, you find your own spin on a topic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, I told you I couldn't speak. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, so actually, I think uh, it's important to note that, so I've talked to multiple people and been like, oh, you should really speak, and they always say, yeah, but I'm not the expert. And as somebody who has listened to multiple experts speak, I can tell you that sometimes they are the most boring presenters ever. Uh, and really, it's not always about being the you know the person that wrote the um, like wrote the software or whatnot. It's about being able to take a complex topic and break it down into smaller pieces that other people can understand. Uh, and so, for example, I gave a presentation in 2014 at Bad Camp at uh, Kick Ass with SAS. I think we also gave it at GovCon as well. And I had gotten the feedback from several people that it was the best presentation that they had seen on SAS, that they finally understood certain aspects of SAS that, that they just weren't getting. And I know, like, I've had that experience also with talking to Sarah. Um, one day I was having a really hard time understanding interactive rebasing and other complicated Git workflows. And I talked to Sarah for 15 minutes and she was able to break something down that you know, I had read from multiple blogs and talked to multiple people, but it's just about how you can reach an individual person. Um, sometimes that, like, exact not knowing the thing in and out is exactly what people need from you when you're giving a talk. Um, so coming in there with, like, a fresh slate, you don't know all the ins and outs, you don't realize that that thing you've been staring at constantly for months is a little bit confusing. So that can be a really good angle to come in and speak on something from. Um, I have actually personally done this. The first time that I gave a talk for anything um, was back in like 2012-ish. And I wanted to use like the Omega theme on a few projects, but I'd never used it on anything before. And in order to get familiar enough with it to suggest it, whether it would have been a good fit, I actually uh, started researching it on my own on like a little side site and like taking screenshots and notes of different things I had to do to get things to happen. And it's not like I came in here and was like, you know, hey, I don't know everything about Omega, <laughs> you know, listen to me talk. It was really just, you know, here's my experiences with this thing and, you know, this was kind of tricky, but this is neat, look at this, you know. And I took all these slides that I had worked on and I went to Maryland camp and I was terrified that somebody was gonna ask me some crazy ass theming question and everybody's gonna be like, you don't know what you're talking about. And I gave the talk and I actually got a lot of like interesting questions 
had conversations with people who came up afterwards, and it was a big relief. And it's, it's really not a bad reason to be giving a talk. Um, you can really engage people in this stuff. And speaking as someone who was in the audience when Sarah gave that talk, I had no idea it was her first time speaking. She was really prepared, she knew her topic inside and out, and she put a lot of thought into her slides, so I just showed up excited to learn from her. A lot of times the, the judgments that you project on people in the audience are just not anchored in the way that people actually perceive your presentation, so as long as you're prepared, people can end up really connecting with it. And so finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about how um, the you need to take responsibility for the trajectory of your career because in reality, nobody else will. Uh, so uh, there are kind of two traditional ways to respond to feeling like a fraud. Even you're either burning yourself out to pr prove that you belong in the community and at your job, or you can be passive about pursuing advanced opportunities. And they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, but this holds you back whether you want to find a new job or to move up at your current place of employment. So the first thing that you should do um, when you realize, hey, like I'm suffering from imposter syndrome and I wanna make a move, whether it's moving up at my company or um, finding another company, is you really need to start doing your research. And so the first thing that I suggest is to seek out supportive work cultures that would promote uh, a healthy work-life balance, for example, if you know that you're somebody who's just prone to overworking yourself, find a place that values giving you vacation that's not going to push you, uh, you know, uh, to work extraordinary hours. You know, a place that promotes equal pay because you know that you're not particularly good at advocating for yourself um, or negotiating. And, you know, and also really important, is there a diversity or is there a monoculture? And um, so in addition to that, type of research, often it can be very difficult to establish reasonable salary expectations when you're fighting that internal urge to hold yourself back and think, I'm not worth this. So taking the emotional aspects out and just talking to people about you know what, what are reasonable salaries from where I'm at and looking on Glassdoor, looking at any uh, other research that's available will help you get a number that you, um, that you feel that you can confidently ask for rather than you know, just something that you feel like you're worth. Uh, and another thing is you would want to look at your network and find some referrals, like see what other companies are doing and where you might be a good fit. Um, the last point I would make about doing research is that when you're doing your research, don't just do research for the job that you want next, but think about the job that you want after that so that you're constantly looking to move forward in your career trajectory. Uh, if you do want to move up at the company that you're currently at, you have a couple, you have a lot to think about. One thing is where you want to be uh, immediately and what kind of expertise you have, and the other is uh, whether or not your company has room for that. You should be able, when you uh, realize that there's somewhere you want to go, to talk to your boss and say, look, I know I'm currently doing a front-end development job, I'm interested in going in a senior developer job, or you know, UX, I want to move up to senior UX, and have them respond to you, not necessarily with, cool, here, here is that job, enjoy. But certainly with, we want you to have this much experience, we want you to have taken on these kinds of projects, this is gonna give you the opportunity to go in that direction. Uh, or to tell you, we're not gonna be hiring for that for a while and you know, genuinely engage with you on that. Uh, most of the time, you may be sitting there thinking that if your boss doesn't approach you and hold out that opportunity and just be like, Heather, would you like to do this? Why, yes I would. Uh, you may think that you don't have the room to do that and the simple reality is that usually the people who are vocal about this people who express their interest in taking on that responsibility are the people that managers turn to when they need more responsibility taken on. It's of course also very possible that when you start having that conversation, uh, your boss will look at you and go, eh, eh. And if that happens, then you may need to think about very seriously about whether that's a job that you can continue to have upward momentum at. Now, if you wind up in this <laughs> situation, it doesn't necessarily mean that you were at a bad company or even a bad job. Sometimes this is just like an interpersonal thing or a stage of life kind of thing where the, the situation is just not right for who you are, what you want. You know, maybe you would really like to work somewhere that like enables you to contribute code back to your projects or you need to be on the other coast for you know, mental health reasons and everybody has to work in this office in DC. Or you know, there's, there's a plethora of reasons why a situation may not be a good fit. Um, and if you feel like um, the role that you're in or the place that you're in isn't working out for you. Um, the way to get through this isn't to throw yourself into the job and work extra hours and just sort of hope that you're gonna get a raise or a job is gonna fall on your lap. 
Um, and the longer that you uh, get into that sort of situation, it, it kind of cycles, your, your resume can get stale, your portfolio may start to get stale, uh, and it gets harder and harder to make like it moves that can benefit you. You, you kind of get stuck. And um, you need to forgive yourself for that and actually reach out to the people that you've been networking with. Um, in some situations, um, when you're really like down talking yourself, this is the only way that you, uh, things can move forward positively. Um, <coughs> you, if you have imposter syndrome, it's very difficult for you to you know, self-evaluate and say like, that would be a good fit for me. Um, and people that you know uh, are going to tell you, no, no, look, we have all these positions that you would be great for, come on, apply to them. And like, uh, literally, I would not be at Acquia if it was on my own initiative because um, there were like a few job situations I was in, don't assume I'm talking about you, <laughs> um, but there was only a few job situations I was in where I was like, you know, this isn't really working for me for X, Y, Z reasons. Um, but I was always like, you know, I'm not really Acquia material, you know? Uh, so I, I wouldn't have ever like sent out my resume on my own, but people who I had worked with at previous jobs or in previous projects were like, you know, hey, we're looking, why don't you try this out? Um, and, you know, go for it. Uh, yeah, uh, once you do decide that you want to move on, it's important to uh, be realistic about the kind of jobs you can do, but not be realistic in a negative way. Uh, there's a really interesting Hewlett Packard internal report on hiring and how men and women approach this process differently. I found that women wouldn't apply for a job unless they met 100% of the qualifications, whereas men were likely to apply if they met as few as 60%. <laughs> So uh, the author, um, one of the authors who wrote for the Harvard Business Review found this and said like, wait, it's, like I'm a woman and it's not that I don't think I can do the job, it's just that I think that if I apply, I'm gonna waste my time because no one's gonna take a second look at me. Uh, and they theorized the reason this quote made the rounds like wildfire on the internet is that it was a wake up call that not everyone is playing the game that way. And the more that you know that other people are not, uh, other people are not self-selecting out of opportunities, the more freedom it gives you to do that. So in my uh, role as director, I uh, make the hiring decisions for a technology team and can tell you that while we do think really seriously about the job descriptions we put together, uh, if someone comes and says like, look, I don't know how to do that one thing, but I know how to do these other things you haven't listed, that is something we still consider. It's also worth keeping in mind that plenty of places do not, um, you know, especially large firms, they might have job descriptions written by people in HR, not written by people who are actually doing the work. So don't let job descriptions scare you off from it think really seriously about what you want, and then uh, go in really prepared to talk in your interviews about what you know, not what you don't know, and to consciously redirect the conversation in that way. It's really hard if you feel like an imposter. It is really hard to, uh, when you get that question you're dreading, uh, you know, if you know this technology, not to just kind of crumble and be like, no, I don't know it, but I'd really love to learn, eh, and then sort of let it fizzle out. And it's much, much more compelling if you can say, no, I don't know that, but let me tell you about a time when I learned a new technology and the benefit it brought to my team. This is why I feel confident that I could pick it up here and contribute to the team. Uh, the more that you go in thinking about why you are a great hire, the more you're able to tell that story. So if you have this list of your day-to-day -day recognition, if you have this list of your bigger wins, if you've been consciously focusing on not down-talking yourself in that way, you're more capable of walking in and having the conversation about the person you are and where you contribute, rather than this person in your head who is like just lucking into every single opportunity they have and who only has these success be successes because they've charmed their way into them. It's easy to feel that way and it's hard to get your way out, but if you focus consciously on retraining yourself in that way, you can eventually be able to kind of shut down a lot of your imposter syndrome feelings. Okay. Everybody yeah. together. Yep. <laughs> what do we say to the imposter syndrome? Not, Not today. <laughs> so uh, thank you guys very much for the attention. We are really happy to uh, take questions. And if you do feel like uh, an imposter who like still kind of finding your feet in the community, I highly recommend the Friday sprints. These are the times which we'll leave up here. And please also feel free to give us feedback. Uh, and thanks. connect with us on the Twitters. On the Twitters. Thank you guys. microphone there, but it's also a really small room, so I feel like if you just raise your hand and just for yell, recording, for you recording, can commit. For I will, Mike. we will repeat it in here. <laughs> I think over here was first. So, uh, thank you for the talk. When you have people on your team that clearly suffer from, you know, this 
issue in a way, not issue, not don't supplement, but display like examples of it. How do you usually approach that person? And do you ever have on the second facet of that question, do you ever have that issue for like upwards to a manager? So two part question. The first part is uh, if you have people on your team who are displaying imposter syndrome tendencies, how do you deal with it? And second, do you ever feel that way with your managers? Yeah, I would say, I would, well, first thing I would ask you is like, what is your relationship to that person on the team? Because I think that that would, you know, influence the dynamic. And I would say if you're talking about a coworker, that's kind of, you know, in a lateral to you, um, I would, you know, tell them that you're receptive to talking about it. And instead, when you catch them doing the negative, like, I just did this, I just did that, you know, stop them and say, uh, say thank you. You know, it's okay to point out, I think, um, you know, and let, but let that person know that you're a safe person to talk to. I'd also add, um, I, so personally, because I know that I felt like this way, this way a lot in my career, uh, I'm very likely to talk to people when they say, I couldn't do that, I can't do it on that project, and say, hold on, actually, you know, you can, you've done it on these projects, and this is a great growth opportunity for you, and kind of try to help them see that they can grow, uh, rather than, like, I try not to yell at them for negative self-talk, and instead focus them on what they have contributed that has been really positive. I also think uh, it's so internal that like there may be some people who have sort of like obvious like uh, low confidence in their interactions, but a lot of times you might not realize that you're dealing with people that have these feelings because they really do just keep it inside and it makes you just feel bad, but your interactions with other people are still strong and nobody would ever call you on this. And in terms of uh, upward, I would say mostly uh, just consciously stopping the negative self-talk as much as you can. If you're dealing with your own manager, don't say I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a poor move generally, uh, and one that I have made a few times in my career. So uh, I think it's really just focusing on your narrative and how, um, what, where you're growing, and then also not being afraid to say, look, where would it be helpful for you to have me grow my skills more in the future? It's a confident question, and bosses react well to it. Uh, it really is making it about what the business needs, not about your own insecurities, so it tends to work out pretty well. Uh, Thanks for the talk. This is really cool to have this. I've been doing a lot of technical stuff, so having something more, you know, so social is really helpful. Uh, I definitely suffer from imposter syndrome, and uh, one thing I've been learning. This is my first DrupalCon. Obviously, community. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, come on. <laughs> Applause for first DrupalCon. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, obviously, uh, after the the keynote uh, today, I was learning that you know one of the biggest parts of Drupal is just this community. It's like not just a software framework, it's like all the people that are using it and making it. Um, and one of the parts of that is obviously obviously contributing to it, like with code. Um, as you can probably guess, someone with imposter syndrome has a hard time even knowing where to start with that. And uh, you know, obviously there's all these people coding and I wanna, I wanna possibly help, but it's really hard getting over that hump of like, you know, how can I just like, oh, you know, you should take this code because obviously I know what I'm doing and you should make it part of your big software package that's been around for 17 years that I just started using a year ago. Um, you know, is, is it more about asking for the forgiveness of, oops, I didn't do good code, I'll fix it, or asking for permission and waiting and getting good before you start or just but, you know, fail early, fail often. Kind so, of can I repeat the question before? Yeah, go ahead and repeat the question. <laughs> Sorry, that was a really uh, long question. Yeah, yeah, no. So, uh, for the recording, um, the short version of that, uh, which is a really great question in long form, sorry you guys didn't get to hear it, uh, is that basically when you are wanting to contribute to Drupal and be part of the community, uh, if you're showing up to those events and then feeling like you are you don't have the expertise to contribute, how do you get over that and how do you not feel like you're um, giving bad code to a 17-year project? Um, I guarantee you people have contributed bad code before. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, we do have, like, within the board, there's, there's uh, two, two events up here. One is the first time sprinter <coughs> workshop, and the second one is the mentored core sprint. And I think the really important thing about sprinting is the whole point is do not be afraid to ask for help. Do not feel that asking for help makes you less of a coder. Like, that is exactly what open source is about. Nobody knows it all. Nobody knows every little subsystem of Drupal. And um, I guarantee you that the sprints are not going to be judgy about what you're putting up. And it's all about talking to other people, collaborating, sharing, and getting stuff fixed. And no single patch is the product of any one person. There are tons of people who helped put code up there, who helped test help write documentation, which is also a very important contribution. And yeah, 
I'd also add that you're gonna make you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna get some patches rejected. It's gonna suck when you do, but then you'll like in the process of doing that, you're gonna learn more about the product and feel more um, more able to contribute to it. There's always a point when you are um, a beginner with something that is brand new. That doesn't mean that you don't have the aptitude to learn quickly and move forward. So giving yourself permission to make mistakes is gonna lead to you ultimately being a stronger Drupal developer and a stronger contributor. So I'd advise you to go with it anyway. It's also not like you're not usually coming up and like writing a module from scratch, you're usually helping with a defined issue, uh, and people are really good about kind of monitoring the issues that go into those sprints, so I hope that that answers your question well. Thank you. I'd also like to comment as a module maintainer, we're really restricted in the time that we have to do stuff, so we're generally really thankful for people to offer their solutions, even if they're imperfect, because they might be a problem that we might not be able to get to anyways. Um, so a lot of module maintainers are just very thankful of any help and would rather help you solve the solution yourself, even if it takes a little bit longer to kind of fill in those gaps. I think we're all here because we experience uh, some self-doubt in our careers, whether we're beginners or advanced. I'd like to thank these three ladies especially for sharing their voice, their message, and the tools to uh, help with that. I'm going to pay them a compliment. I think this is going to be the, the session that I get the most out of at Drupal. Oh. It's not a coding session. but. It's going to be my favorite one, so thank you very much. You can choose to. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Let's go find us. That was a given. And I, I do have a couple of uh, questions. Uh, one, Dunning Kruger effect, is this related to that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and number two, um, I was one of the, the first people here, and it was interesting because I'd say like 80% of the people here are males. Mm -hmm. But like, First people that showed up, 90% females, and you guys kind of touched on the female perspective of that, and maybe you want to address that just a little bit. And my designated role is question <laughs> recapper. Uh, the two parts of that are, one, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, how much influence has that had, and number two, uh, for men who are in the community, it's of course possible for men to have imposter syndrome as well, but it is, pr like, it often feels like a female problem. How do we kind of respond to that? So, okay, we'll start with Dunning-Kruger. Dunning-Kruger is the inverse of imposter syndrome. Dunning-Kruger is when you think that you know everything, but in reality, you know nothing. Uh, so, uh, people with Dunning-Kruger often overinflate their accomplishments and achievements, and you know them. They're called assholes. <laughs> also, it's, it's hard to tell if people are doing that because they really don't know that they don't know or they feel like they have to in order to look like a businessman, you know, or, or woman. Or a businesswoman. Or, yeah, 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 no, seriously, I've, had, I've definitely yeah. had yeah, <laughs> um, and the I think the, the gist of it is it's the same problem in reverse. You just don't have a realistic assessment of yourself and what you can do. So I think that could be equally damaging, um, but I, I don't have any specific solutions for coping with it. Do you want to weigh in on Dunning-Kruger now? <laughs> I think my advice to that would be kind of similar to the advice for imposter syndrome. I think that uh, you know getting out in the community and meeting people is important, but I do think that more people, the Dunning-Kruger effect, I think more people are afraid when they do feel like imposters, they're afraid of inflating their accomplishments because they're afraid that it'll be perceived as Dunning-Kruger, yeah. and that is really damaging. So talking to people, getting like an outside kind of yardstick to measure yourself against becomes really critical, uh, regardless of which of these things you think you may have. All right, so the second question about women uh, suffering from imposter syndrome and whether it is a quote unquote woman problem is, uh, well, the short answer is no, it is not a woman's problem, it is an everybody problem. Uh, but if you are holding yourself back and then society in general is also looking at you as a woman and going, uh, you know, I've had an experience, plenty of experiences where it's like, uh, oh, so you're a content strategist, you're a, you know, business dev person or you're a this or that rather than a web developer. If you already feel like a fraud and somebody looks at you and points to you and like you're a fraud, then it's going to be like doubly damaging, basically. I knew everybody knew I wasn't a developer. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a double whammy, I think, socially there, and, and that's like the main gist of it. Right. So it's important, I think, to understand like I, that it does affect everybody, but that women may be hit harder. Sure. I think in general, anytime it's someone who feels underrepresented in the community, it can feel harder. I think that also is usually not helpful advice for like, it, it, can, it can be unhelpful to feel like you need to internalize that as a man because you're like, Am I an imposter in my imposter syndrome? I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> uh, so I think what, you know, 
whatever position you're in, it's important to be like to be kind to yourself and to focus on your accomplishments and to find other people who feel that way. And frankly, I think that for women, it can be really helpful to hear that men feel that way too, to, to feel like it's a little bit, um, uh, makes everyone feel more sane. But people do discuss it more as a woman problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Of the original study was to do with uh, women yeah. in particular. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that there's also added socialization mm -hmm. that women receive, like messages from the time that we're young that I think makes it even harder because we're always kind of taught to be nice and- Be humble, yeah. share credit. Mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, sort of a stereotypical like American male thing is to go out there and don't show any weaknesses. So there's that's, that's sort of like two, you know, sort of flip sides of our socialization that get in the way of being yeah. a whole person. Uh, okay. So a lot of the advice that you've given is about either turning to a mentor or turning to connections in your community or an external yardstick or something like that. Um, and I don't know, or, or a list of accomplishments, good feedback you're getting, and maybe I'm betraying my own imposter syndrome here, but what if you feel completely lost with that advice? Like, you feel like you don't have connections to turn to. You feel like you're not getting good feedback. Maybe you are, maybe you're, maybe you're just so deep in your own imposter syndrome that all this advice sounds really great, but you're like, but where do I find these things that you're talking about? Where do I find the connections that I feel like I can't make? Where do I find the mentorship that doesn't feel like it's just happening for me? Do you want to recap the question? Of course. Uh, <laughs> if you do feel like uh, an imposter and you feel like a lot of these are looking for validation from external sources, uh, it's really hard to, um, if you feel like you don't have those external sources to validate you, what do you do next? How do you either get them or how do you find a way to kind of to disconnect, to not need them. Am I summarizing your question well? It's, it's close. Okay. Yeah. Uh, more how do you get those people like mentorship or community feedback or a network that can help you if you don't feel like you have them already? I talk a lot, so. I will happily talk. talk. Okay. I can give you an introvert answer. The thing that's helped me the most honestly is reading books. There, there are a lot of good books out there about this and you know blog posts, like this is a really common feeling and um, talking about it is the best step, but I think reading about it is pretty good. And I do think if you don't have this network now, you can have this network. And it may take some time to build it up. You may be going to events over and over again and just seeing people and maybe not making such deep connections, but it's worth going out there and trying to build this up. And you know, if you don't have like a local meetup group already or it's like a, a drive, you may actually be able to be that meetup group. What Heather was talking about at UMD, she actually just started you know, putting up, you know, hey, we're gonna be here, this, this, this location, talking about this stuff, and people will show up um, if, you know, if you don't live on an island with a volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> the volleyball can validate you. I mean, there, there, yeah. there, there, are, there are some limitations to some of these fixes. <laughs> I'd also add that um, a really good source of that kind of feedback can actually be, especially if you don't feel comfortable talking about it at where you're currently working, people who have previously worked with you can be an excellent source for that kind of thing. Going to someone and saying, look, what did you value about working with me? Where did you feel like I did a good job? Uh, you know, what if, if you were in my position, what would you do next? I think it's easy to underrate how much positive impact that has uh, on you, especially if you're struggling. Like it can, it's, it's important to hear from someone who knows you that you have done good work. And I think that there are many people who um, are happy to give that feedback once they're asked. But that said, it, is, it can feel really isolating and it's hard to not have, um, not feel like you have that mentor to go to at the moment, but through more involvement, through attending local meetups, I think you can find them if you uh, make yourself open to it. And also I would say that you don't need necessarily a physical meetup. Uh, oh, yeah. but, like, there's a Drupal yes. Slack and like there's Websites. IRC and such, but like there's actually a supportive group of people and I'm gonna shout out to the Drupal Diversity and Inclusivity Initiative. Like if you get in that Slack channel, like these people will make you feel like a rock star. Like seriously, there are, there are people who will have your back in the community. You just, you know, I know it's, it's, it's kind of tough when you feel like you're the newcomer. Yeah, virtual communities are totally a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess for me, this is a sort of piggybacking on her question. So I guess for me sometimes, I feel like a leech. Like I would like to talk to people, get to know information, and I appreciate the information they share, but I feel like I have nothing to give you. I basically just leeched off of you. I know this feeling. <laughs> 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 so how would you overcome that? Yeah. So 
the question is about uh, if you do feel like a leech, if you feel like you're taking people's expertise and you're not giving them back anything in return, how do you deal with it? I think we're all lunging for the mic right now, but I got here first. Uh, so, tricked my way here. Uh, so one thing I would say is there is legitimately nothing more rewarding in my entire career than helping people who need it. Like legitimately, as a, as a manager, as a member of the community, there is nothing better than talking to someone about where they want to advance and helping that happen. So I think that while you might not be giving something back literally as in you're teaching them something, which can also happen by the way, I think that there's, a, there's real benefit in that relationship to getting to help someone else kind of explore their skills through mentorship. I wouldn't think of that as a one-way relationship because it is two-way and two fundamentally different ways. Yeah, and piggybacking off of what Kat is saying, basically if you're allowing somebody to mentor you, like keep in mind that your mentor may also be feeling some imposter syndrome, so when you give them positive feedback about like, oh hey, you just like helped me do this and now I just got a new job or I did this, like that's, you're going to help like reaffirm their own sense of like value and then they're gonna feel better about themselves too. So, like me, st uh, stalking is such a bad word. I told myself <laughs> I would use it. Me showing up at Sarah's Omega Talk and being like, hello, I learned so much from you, uh, was not just beneficial for me to then get to pick her brain about Omega more. It was also beneficial for her to realize she'd gone out on a limb and it had been a good thing. I'm going to be corny and say you don't really know something until you can explain it to someone else. Anyone <laughs> <laughs> over there? Oh, well, I was just Yeah, and, and oh yeah, women women who code is is one good resource, and there's there's groups like that, uh, virtually and physically all over the country, um, for various technologies or just generally uh, for different groups of people. And with that, I think we might be getting kicked out of this room in a minute. I don't know if there's another session in here after us. Uh, one more question, and then we'll call it. Wait, I think he beat you. I'm gonna make a short comment about what he said. His question previously, so lead off to your question. Um, you had st spoken about Donnie Kruger, is that it? Dun Donnie, Donnie Kruger. Kruger. Donnie Kruger. Kruger. Okay. Now that's so. D-U-N-N-I-N-G-K-R-U-G-E-R, -E for those who are trying Donnie to figure Kruger. out what that is. Donnie Kruger. You big word for me. Um, yeah. Donnie Kruger effect versus, you know, imposter syndrome. And I guess at the end of the day, Donnie Kruger effect is just, you know, a result of imposter syndrome, except it's that other extreme. Now, for like, you know, Tons of developers are more introverted, makes sense. And I've had friends who are like that. And I tell them, listen, are you afraid of being an asshole? You shouldn't. <laughs> if there's a way to resolve this thing, and I know you're extremely smart, be an asshole. <laughs> Do full on Donnie Kruger. Because I, I know who you are. Because the thing is, at the end of the day, if you don't have an established relationship with yourself, and you can't say, I love you to myself, you can't have a proper relationship established to your teammates, to the outside, because you're on this shaky basis, and you, that's not what you deserve. So that's the thing, you can was, be an asshole was there a question? in the short term. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of re recapping that for the folks at home, uh, basically the idea that with Dunning-Kruger, uh, Dunning-Kruger is essentially, um, Wow, I'm really trying to recap this one. Oh, so you don't you don't know what you don't know. So you you might be talking completely out of your ass about something, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. um, right? JavaScript frameworks or whatever, what have you. Uh, um, go ahead. Yeah, and the point that uh, was being made was that uh, it's okay to you know it's okay to be an asshole. It's okay to not entirely know what you're talking about and get up and talk about it anyway. Again, I hope I'm recapping you okay. And I would say I think that there is a level of that. You have to be okay making mistakes. You have to get up yeah. there and talk about something you're not confident about. The only way it goes into Dunning Kruger territory is if it's like consistent and it's it's really an issue with like um, people who have no gauge on what they know. And I think that if it's just getting involved and taking risks in the community, you absolutely have to do that. If you're not comfortable with yourself, then uh, it'll keep being a challenge for you. But Dunning Kruger could be pretty toxic, so I don't know. I yeah, I, I feel yeah. kind of yeah, I feel kind of conflicted about my response to that. Okay. Um, but I, do, oh. And I think we're, we're oh, at time. Okay. We got to get out of this room. Right. Thank you guys so much for your time.